Hi, thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Raise your hand if you are new to Harvard Law School. Ooh. Excellent. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're an LLM student. OK. Uh, and raise your hand if you've had class already today. OK. <laughs> now, I know some of you have class uh, at 1, and uh, we understand that, and you're allowed to go to class. Um, but it is my enormous pleasure. We're going to be finished by then, right? <laughs> yeah. How long do you expect me to talk for? Oh, I, several hours, oh, I okay. thought. Um, it is my enormous pleasure to welcome back to her law school Justice Elena Kagan, who was the dean at this school. She was a professor at this school. She was a student at this school. She was a major in history who went to Princeton. She grew up in New York. New York. <laughs> Thank you. She went to Hunter High. Anybody will go to Hunter High? OK. Uh, she studied at Oxford. She was a law clerk. She was a uh, lawyer in private practice. She was uh, in the White House Counsel's Office. She did domestic policy work for the federal government. She was a law professor at the University of Chicago. She was a law professor here. She designed this building. <laughs> I designed it. Yes, she did. I mean, did. I think Robert Stern might have a different well, <laughs> view about <laughs> You picked about... the carpets. You planned everything. <laughs> and she, she designed a curricular change. And she had this idea that students should be the center of the Harvard Law School experience. And that's why you have free coffee. Uh, <laughs> and indeed, every single day, I say, thank you, Elena Kagan, for what you did to make this school so uh, strong and so fantastic. So uh, Elena Kagan, you have said, I led a school whose faculty and students examine and discuss and debate every aspect of our law and legal system. And what I've learned most is that no one has a monopoly on truth or wisdom. I've learned that we make progress by listening to each other across every apparent political or ideological divide. I'd like you to go back to your jobs before the court. What did you learn from your early jobs? Well, I learned that. <laughs> I see, I'm uh, giving her answers. Look at this. <laughs> what did you learn when from? When did I say that? I said that in my confirmation hearings, right? You did. I said it in, uh, in my opening statement in my confirmation hearings. And it, I, I did. I mean, I think when I sat down to write that opening statement, you know, partly uh, you think about, you know, what's, what it's, uh, uh, you know, what will be a good tone and a good way to, to start the hearings. Um, but, you know, the, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great because it sort of forces you to reflect a little bit on the things that matter to you and what you want to convey about yourself and about what you've learned and what you'll bring to the job. And, uh, and, and, and that was one of the things that I wanted to convey and it was something that I think in large part, I learned here, you know, coming to a place where there were people, students, faculty, staff of so, so many views and so, so many opinions, and a place where people weren't shy about those opinions. And, um, uh, and, and there was a question about how to, how to bridge divides or apparent divides, how to, how to uh, bring people together instead of having people retreat to their corners. And, I guess I thought about that a lot when I was when I was dean, as I'm sure you think about it a lot, yep. and you've done such a fantastic job job at that part of the job, and uh, I mean you've done a fantastic job at every part <laughs> of the job. But, uh, but how much do uh, I owe you? Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but it was really one of the things that I wanted to say to the Senate about myself and what I had learned, and and I think I had particularly learned it here mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, you, you know, just what I said, nobody has a monopoly on truth. And even things that you think about with great certitude, uh, it turns out uh, they might be more complicated than you thought. It turns out you might even be wrong, you know? And that happened lots of times when I was doing this job, and it's happened uh, since. It's happened on the court. Um, and, uh, and just the ability to understand that and to not approach things as though you have, uh, you're the sole holder of wisdom. And the ability to uh, listen 
really hard, you know, here to your, to your colleagues, mm -hmm. to your peers, and to reflect on what you've heard them say, and to acknowledge that uh, 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 even, even if sort of, you know, at, a f at first glance you disagree, there, m there might be something uh, very significant to learn from those disagreements and, fr and from the views that you don't hold. Um, uh, I think that's an important part of being a student here. I think it's an important part of being a faculty or administrator here. And I think it's an important part of my job now. You were described when uh, you were working at the White House as the all-purpose brain. Um, did you learn anything there that you l use in your current job? <laughs> I don't know. Who described me as that? <laughs> uh, I think uh, it was President Clinton, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Uh, uh, OK, I trust you, whatever. <laughs> so what was the question? So did you, <laughs> did you learn anything from your time at the White House that you find relevant to your work as, on the court? You know, I mean, pretty much uh, uh, everything I've done in my life has, you know, some relevance because it makes you the person you are, and you develop different skills and different uh, ways of thinking about the world because of your experiences. And you bring all that to the next thing you do, and then the next thing you do, mm -hmm. and then, in my case, the last thing you do. And um, uh, so, sure, I'm, you know, uh, so yeah, I loved my White House time. I was there for about four years. Uh, much longer than I had expected to be. As you said, I did, I did law in that job. Yeah. And, and so certainly I learned things about doing law in governmental institutions, which is uh, very difficult but profoundly rewarding. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I also did policy in that job, which doesn't have any direct relevance uh, to, to my job now. Um, but, but um, uh, you know, learning about, uh, again, sort of about how institutions work, about how to get things done in institutions, about how to bridge gaps, about how to, uh, y you, know, uh, the, you know, the White House was full of people with diverse views and, and, and sort of making progress in that environment and bringing people along. And it's not directly relevant to my job, but you know, this is the, 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 the job I'm in now. It's a different kind of governmental institution. Uh, fewer people, you know, in some sense simpler, in some sense yeah. uh, more complex. But uh, uh, a large part of what we do is about the workings of government. And to the extent that the four years I spent in the White House uh, really gave me a much greater understanding of the workings of government. It, um, it, it affects my work that in that way. And, uh, and also, at the same time, uh, you know, the institution I'm part of is an institution of mm -hmm. government. And, and everything I learned about, uh, ab about how, to, uh, you know, how to work within those institutions in an effective way is something I also bring to my job now, just sort of as a matter of course. The job you had just before joining the court uh, was to be the Solicitor General of the United States, to be the lawyer for the United States government. It's an unusual job. Can you describe to people what are the parts of that job and what's distinctive about that office? It's a great job. It's maybe, it's maybe the greatest job a lawyer can have. Um, it's, uh, uh, you are representing the United States in all appellate courts, not only in the Supreme Court, but in all appeals courts as well. And uh, so there are many different aspects of the job. Uh, you decide what cases to appeal. Any, any decision that the United States loses in the first level of courts, the district courts, uh, you have a decision to make as to whether or not to keep pressing your position. And so uh, uh, so all appeals have to be approved by the Solicitor General. That's the first part of the job, and that's just a constant sort of day-to-day. -day. You know, everybody always wants you to appeal their case. The case they've lost, they feel invested in it. But lots of times, the United States decides, or the Solicitor General decides on behalf of the United States, not to do that, to only push the cases where when you look at them, you think, 
you know, the government was both right and right in an important way. Um, so, uh, so, you know, that's the first thing you do, but you also superintend all the work um, uh, uh, in the Supreme Court. And that involves two things. It involves both the cases where the United States is a party, and that's probably 25%, I'm guessing a little bit, but about 25% of the court's overall docket. And then in addition, the United States, although not a party in many cases, um, has views about how different cases should come out, and so expresses those views as an amicus curiae, a friend of the court. And the court can ask the SG to and, do that. And the court can ask the SG. Typically, the court asks the SG not to participate in merits briefing, because usually the government has a very standard way of making that decision. And I was, I was going to say the, um, the government participates in probably two-thirds to three-quarters wow. of the court's uh, cases, e either as a party or more often, actually, as an amicus, where the United States says, look, we're not a party to this case, but we have a very significant interest in how you interpret this statute or in how you conceive of this constitutional rule. And we'll tell you why we have that interest, and then we'll also present to you uh, a position. And so um, in, in those two ways, uh, the, the United States participates you know, in a very, very, very substantial part of the Supreme Court's docket. So when you go and you become a justice to the court, you're almost just like uh, switching sides of the podium, you know, because you spend all your time as the Solicitor General thinking about the court, thinking about really its entire docket, why it takes cases, what it should do with the cases it takes, and then you're thinking about all those same questions just from a different perspective and vantage point when you become a justice. As you said, the Solicitor General also can be asked by the court whether it should take particular kinds of cases. And again, the court will know that when the United States is a party, because there the Solicitor General will, mm -hmm. will, will petition or will oppose a petition. But even when the United States isn't a party, the court will often reach out to the Solicitor General. And, and it's, I think, a measure of the respect that the court has for the Solicitor General's office and, 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 and a measure uh, of the court's understanding that the Solicitor General's office is full of people who have this really quite extraordinary knowledge about federal law. Uh, and the court will sort of reach out and say, should we take this case? And the, you know, the Solicitor General will file a brief saying yes or no. It's not like the court always pays attention to that advice. There are plenty of times where the court does exactly the opposite of what the Solicitor General recommends. But again, it's, uh, it's a measure of the respect that the court has for the Solicitor General's office as an institution. So it was a great, it was a great, great uh, uh, job. I mean, uh, once a month, I would appear before the court and argue a case, you know, typically the most important case. Uh, Your the, very first argument in any court. Uh, well, not in any court, <laughs> but it was my first appeals, appeals argument. argument. I had never done an, an appellate yeah. argument before I became Solicitor General. You might ask, why did the president appoint me? <laughs> and only he can answer that. But, um, but, uh, but yes, it okay. was a really new thing for me. Yeah. And um, uh, so once a month, I would show up and I would uh, uh, argue a case. But behind the scenes, uh, you know, I was like a approving every brief that got submitted uh, or deciding, whether you know, to, deciding yeah. whether to submit a brief, um, and uh, uh, and then deciding all the appeals decisions as well. So it's an incredible job, really hard job, but um, a fantastic way to understand how the entire federal legal system works. Fantastic way to understand a whole, uh, you know, bodies of law that I, at least for me, that I hadn't thought about since law school, or maybe that I hadn't thought about ever. Um, so, so I learned an incredible amount in the very, you know, in the pretty short time that I did that job. Which is more challenging, to work as Solicitor General or to work as a justice? Uh, y you know, they, they each have their own challenges, obviously, and both are hard jobs and both are rewarding jobs, both. But sort of on a day-to-day -day level, I actually think that the harder job is the, solic is the Solicitor General's, at least in, at least in this way, that 
uh, if you ask me, uh, is, is it harder to do the argument sure. or to be on the bench during the argument? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a, a lot harder to do the argument. I mean, uh, we make lawyers' jobs very difficult, I have to say. <laughs> we are a very active bench. We're a very hot bench. Uh, we have lots of, of uh, uh, when, we, when, when we hear argument, we in part want to hear what the lawyers have to say. But that's actually not the only thing that we're doing when we hear argument. We also are listening hard to each other. We're listening to what each other has to say. We're trying to make points to our colleagues. And we're trying to listen and respond to the points that our colleagues are making. And that often means that the lawyers who are up at the microphone <laughs> don't get a whole heck of a lot of chance to talk. I mean, that, that, that what they say is maybe not the most important thing that is being said. Uh, up there, um, and that can be very frustrating for the lawyers. Uh, you know, the lawyers, uh, you know, have a job to do, and they want to make some points, and often we make it very hard for them to make those points. Now, uh, I, I, I don't get o feeling overly guilty about this, um, <laughs> because after all, they've written us briefs of 50 or 60 pages. Uh, hopefully, those points, all the points that are important to them are made in those briefs. We take those briefs very seriously. We're a very prepared court. All of us come to uh, uh, the arguments having thoroughly thought about, read those briefs. Um, and, and so, you know, if that's true, the, the value of sort of hearing some of those arguments repeated is maybe not as great as in the moment a lawyer might think. But, um, but, but I also don't get guilty because it's an important part of our decision-making process, not only hearing from the lawyers, but actually conversing with each other. And it so happens that we've structured a process where the first time we get together about a case uh, is during argument. We don't talk about a yeah. case prior to argument. Really, this is the first time to, to sort of engage with your colleagues' views about the case. And that's important because the next time that you'll engage with your colleagues' views about a case is at our formal argument. And our formal argument is, happens a couple of days after argument, so uh, uh, our formal conference, which happens a couple of days after argument. So it gives everybody a little bit of a chance to think about the argument and think about what they've heard, again, not only from the lawyers, but from each other. And then we all sit around a table. We all have kind of assigned places around a table. And there's no one else in the room. There's no one else in the room. Just nine the, of you. Just the nine of us. Our clerks aren't there. The mm -hmm. members of the court's staff aren't there. And um, uh, the Chief Justice always starts things off. It's a little bit of a seniority-based institution, uh, much more than I was accustomed to coming from academia, where seniority is yeah. not particularly important. But this is, and the chief always starts things off, and he does a great job. He's, he sort of you know, talks about, here's the case, here are the issues. So he gives a little bit of common background. And then he- Chief um, Justice John Roberts, class of 1979, Harvard Law School. OK. <laughs> if, if you're going to interrupt and say that every time I mention a colleague. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you'll be saying it a lot, is what. Um, uh, and then it goes around the table. Actually, you know, it's, it's, it, it, he sits on one end of the table. Justice Scalia, who's the senior associate justice, do you want to say? That's okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Very he, proud of him. Yes. He, he sits at the other end of the table. And then it goes around the table in order of seniority. And each person will say what, will, will uh, you know, uh, talk about what they think of the case and how it should come out and then cast a tentative vote. So by the time it gets to me, you know, I speak ninth. And it means that eight members of the court have already spoken about a case and have already cast tentative votes, which can be changed. But still, you know, they're sort of saying what they think. So when you think of it that way, and then you think of what I might want to do at argument before the conference, you can understand why I might want to be talking a little bit to my colleagues and not just <laughs> asking questions um, to the lawyers. Because if I have a sort of distinctive yeah. take on a case, if I have an idea about a case, if I have something that's not 
so much expressed in the briefs as a view about how the case should come out. And I want to sort of get my colleagues thinking about it. Really, the argument is the, is the time that I have that can, <laughs> can, can most do that. And I think other people, even people who speak much uh, sooner than I do in conference, think about argument in that same way as a chance to get your colleagues to start thinking about a case in the way that you're thinking about it, uh, if you are thinking about it uh, already in a certain way. I mean, sometimes you go into arguments and, and, you're, and you're really up in the air. And, and then you do a completely different kind of thing. But if you kind of have a take on a case already, it's perfectly possible because the, the briefs and all the stuff that happens prior to argument is really much more significant than the half hour of argument that each side gets right. to make their case. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you have some sense of, of the way the case should come out and of what your colleagues ought to be thinking about, um, uh, you know, argument is, is the time to start expressing those ideas. I believe it was Chief Justice Berger who pushed for a design of your bench so that you can see each other. So there's a. Uh, well, that was a very smart thing, yeah. yeah, because it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. It's a little bit of a semicircle. Right. right. So that when I sort of look to my right, you know, I sit on one far end of the bench, uh, I can see everybody. Um, uh, so, yeah. One last question about the Solicitor General versus Justice Job. <laughs> Asking questions, answering questions. How do you view what the difficulty is and what the excitement is about being on either side of that? Yeah, so, uh, so I, when, when I started to say we're a very hot bench, because we do all these different things uh, in argument, I mean, there are a lot of us, and we're, and we're asking questions, but we're also doing other things. Uh, basically, the lawyers up there are only getting you know, a couple of sentences, yeah. almost two or three sentences to respond to every kind of question. So you have to be extremely good at thinking on your feet, and you have to be extremely good at condensing all the important things that you have to say to, to really just a few yeah. sentences. And you, you can't be the kind of person that, uh, who, you know, it takes a while to warm up to your point. You know, a lot of people, you, you spend a while sort of clearing your throat before you get to the main point, and you, you, you have to learn not to be that kind of person, to just sort of say what you most want the court to hear immediately without a lot of preparation and without a lot of hemming and hawing. And it's a very hard skill. It's a tough skill. Uh, and um, we're very lucky because we have a lot of people who are sort of established Supreme Court practitioners who do it very well. But I think it's really tough, and 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 uh, I, you know I try to remind myself of how hard it is when I'm asking questions, and I try to give people a little bit of an opportunity to respond because I know how hard it is to be on that side of the podium. It's way easier to ask questions. Uh, you know, <laughs> first off, you can prepare for you know which questions to ask. So probably about a half of my questions, I know I'm going to ask them before I walk in the door. Um, and, uh, and even the other half, which are more spontaneous, which responds to things that the lawyer says or things that my colleagues say, I mean, it's just a lot easier to ask questions than to answer them, <laughs> uh, which you should think about as you, you know, start class, the first year of law about, school, yes. right? Uh, yeah. uh, is that, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to, to answer questions um, right. uh, that are especially hard questions, which are what law professors ask and are what Supreme Court justices ask. And everybody has a bit of a hard time doing it, but it's a great skill. It's a great skill to have uh, or to acquire. I mean, people don't have it naturally. People just, people acquire it as they practice. Apparently, this may have been one of those spontaneous comments, in our uh, argument about whether a statute regulating violent video games was constitutional. You asked the question, would this statute prohibit Mortal Kombat, a video game that you described as iconic? <laughs> <laughs> Justice Scalia interjected at that moment, and he said, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> what is the place of knowledge about culture and, dare I say, 
generational differences on the court? Well, uh, I think you probably underestimate Justice Scalia's knowledge of popular culture and <laughs> overestimate mine in, in, uh, in, in asking that question. So that question was not spontaneous. That question was quite planned. It was a case about violent video games, and there was a kind of uh, vague definition that the statute provided about which violent video games were to be regulated. And the point of the question was to try to get them to put some content on this and like, well, take uh, a violent video game sort of that people know about, which side of the line would, sure. this, would this fall on? And if you can't tell me, that's a problem in, a, right. in itself. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I don't know a lot about video games. <laughs> Uh, I don't know a lot about violent video games. I'll tell you a funny story after I answer your question. And, uh, but I, I, I went into my clerk's office the morning of the argument, and I said, this is the kind of question I want to ask. You know, is there like a violent video game that everybody, <laughs> that everybody will know? And, uh, and so my clerks suggested this, and then they, they, uh, they showed me a little bit of it, you know. <laughs> You did research. And I did research, and uh, <laughs> and then I asked this question, which made me seem yeah. as though <laughs> as though I knew something when it was really only my 28-year-old clerk who knew something. And even that, you know, I think that that's a kind of it's an iconic but sort of dated violin <laughs> video game. So I'm not sure it really demonstrates that you're in the vanguard of knowledge <laughs> about about violent video games. But here's the, the one last thing that I want to say about, about this case, which is a really hard case, super hard case, uh, uh, was that uh, Justice Breyer and I actually played um, the violent video game that was most involved ah. in, in the case. And uh, <laughs> so he had, it, he, he had his clerk set it up in his office, and then <laughs> and I went over to his office, and. And there we were, you know, you know, <laughs> killing everybody left and right. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I should say this. It, it's probably reflective of the fact that we did come out on different sides of this game. I, I, I of like this to case, think yeah. of this case. Uh, I like to think that there are better reasons than that. But but Justice Breyer, I remember, thought that it was all really horrible, really. <laughs> Just like disgusting, and he upheld this. He and, voted to uphold the statute, yeah, and, and he was in dissent. Repellent. Yeah. And I was like, you know, next round, next <laughs> round. <laughs> so. Okay. So. So this past year, you had a case that was called Yates uh, that dealt with uh, interpreting a federal criminal code provision that came out of Sarbanes-Oxley that would conceal, that would criminalize the destruction or concealment of, quote, any record, document, or tangible object. Do you remember this case? I do. Um, to uh, obstruct a federal investigation. And uh, by a five to four vote, the court uh, ruled that the term tangible object, as used in that section, di did mean uh, to uh, refer to a record or preserve information. Somewhere in the middle of the argument, you asked, uh, was it the argument or in the opinion? You discussed Dr. Seuss. Can you connect the dots for us? Uh, it was the opinion. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, is a fish a tangible object? Do you think a fish is a tangible object? <laughs> Raise your hand Everybody if you think fi a fish yes. is a tangible object. Okay. Everybody who thinks no. My point exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for those of you who said no, I mean, really? Tangi <laughs> tangible object? You can touch it, right? You can touch a fish. Yeah. You don't want to, but yes. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the, 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 uh, but the case was a little bit harder than that. In, in my view, not a whole lot harder than that, but just to give my colleagues who actually, there were five there were of my colleagues. Five on the other yeah, side. I dissented. Yeah. Um, uh, so here's the, here's the case. There's, there's, uh, there's this federal statute that says that if you, you know, has like a lot of verbs, mutilate, injure, damage, harm, uh, tear up, destroy, whatever. A record document or tangible object, uh, it's a criminal offense. You know, there's a little bit more in there. Uh, if you, uh, 
a record document or tangible object that's related to a federal investigation in a particular kind of way, it's a criminal right. offense. And uh, you know, you don't want people to destroy no. things that are related to federal, investigation. federal investigations, right? So, uh, so now usually that's paper. I mean, usually it's documents of various kinds which you don't want people to destroy. Uh, preparatory or connected to a federal investigation. Um, uh, but in this case, it wasn't paper. In this case, it was fish. Now, you might say, well, how does a fish connect to a federal investigation? Well, if the federal investigation is about, um, is about catching underweight fish, then you can understand why you might actually want the fish to be there. The fish is kind of the evidence of the offense. And there are. There are yeah. statutes and regulations uh, that are designed to protect, um, uh, you know, to ensure that our, 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 our waterways are not, what is, the, what is the verb for it, like when you de-fish a waterway? You know, depleted. You know, depleted. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there are these regulations that's, uh, that's, that, that say you can't uh, take, you can't, you, Overfish. you gotta throw them back yeah. Yeah. Uh, if they're, under a certain weight or under a certain length or whatever it is. And this was that kind of investigation into this fisherman uh, who had, who was charged with, uh, eventually convicted, of, of uh, taking underweight and undersized fish. And, uh, in, you know, in order to obstruct the investigation, threw overboard those fish and replaced them with right-sized fish. Uh -huh. Well, you can sort of see why that would not be a good thing, right? It's basically destroying the evidence of the crime and pretending that the evidence doesn't exist. Anyway, so, so the question was, is, was that in itself a federal offense? That kind of right. destruction, destruction of, of the fish or you know, removal of the fish and rep replacement with right-sized fish? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I basically said, uh, you know, so th uh, one of the things that you're going to learn about in your first year of law school, for all those of you who are uh, first year students, uh, are sort of statutory interpretation, how we go about interpreting statutes. And I think that the first thing you do, not the only thing that you do, but the first thing you do is you do look at the text. And, uh, and it seemed to me pretty clear that when it said records, documents, and tangible objects, it meant records and documents, but it also meant you know, something broader than that, which was tangible objects. Be and, and that that fit with everything we understood about Congress's purpose, because Congress thought, you know, this usually arises in documentary cases, but there can also be uh, evidence or things that are related to uh, 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 federal investigations that don't have that kind of classic paper form, um, or that aren't used to, I think the, the, um, the majority in order not to limit it only to paper, t talked about the storage of information. And because fish don't store information, <laughs> they said it, you know, I, I mean, honestly, they said because a fish does not store information, it doesn't count as the kind of tangible object that this uh, mm -hmm. statute uh, was going after. And I guess it had some different, the, the majority had some different understanding of the purpose behind the statute. The majority thought that it, the statute was more closely limited than I do to classic examples of corporate fraud in which you would uh -huh. sort of typically think about document shredding as opposed to destroying evidence generally. Um, but uh, anyway, I thought it was a wrong decision. So how did Dr. Seuss come in as I believe the? Yes, the, that was the question. So the, f the first couple of paragraphs of the analysis in my decision just basically say, of course a fish is a tangible object. Here's what object means. Here's what tangible means. A fish counts under any of those normal, ordinary, standard, fair definitions. Uh, and, uh, and, and in, that, in those couple of paragraphs, I said, C, it was a citation, C, Dr. Seuss, <laughs> one, one fish, fish, two fish, <laughs> red fish, blue fish, <laughs> which seemed to me both sort of funny, but also to make the point. Yeah. 
Like a fish is a fish. You can count <laughs> them. You you know they're objects, that's right? right? Uh, so uh, so that's how that that's came excellent. in. That's excellent. Well, this takes us to your opinion writing, which is well known for being accessible, being punchy. Uh, you have been described as the master of the topic sentence. For example, with one opinion begins a trip back in time, begins to show why. And also, you've been known for the stylish dig. Wrong, wrong, and wrong again appears in one opinion. But also, I'm still reading a quotation. This is from Lincoln Kaplan. He says, yet what pushes her in a class by herself is her combination of down-to-earth writing and the ingredients essential to influential opinions, conceptual insight, penetrating legal analysis, and argumentative verve. So what goes into writing your opinions? How, how do you do it? And what do you think is the importance of opinion? Who's the audience for the opinion? Uh, well, it would be nice if that were true. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the court is full of good writers. Uh, and so I learn a lot from reading uh, the writing of some of my colleagues. But I spend a lot of time thinking about it. and. Uh, thinking about how to communicate ideas in, um, in very precise ways, uh, but also persuasive ways, and also accessible ways. And those three things don't necessarily go together all that easily. And uh, you know, sometimes, for example, if you, uh, you know, the most hyper-precise way of yeah. doing something might make something less accessible, and so there's always some kind of balance that goes into um, an opinion writing assignment. But, um, but I think um, you know, a big part of the job is, uh, is, is writing. That's actually a big part of most lawyers' jobs. Not all, but most lawyers' jobs. And again, I'll say that you know, here you are. It's like a room of mostly first-year law students. Like, you, know, you can learn contracts. and. That will be an important thing, uh, but learning writing is the thing that will uh, reap benefits over and over and over again for the rest of your career. That if there's like one thing that you should figure out in the course of law school, uh, it's how to write law as well as how to think about law. It's just as important uh, to think about the one as, 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 as the other, and more important than most substantive bodies. And it's, and it's not the same necessarily as all the writing people do when they're not lawyers. Yeah, I mean, I do think uh, if you're uh, not a good writer generally, then it's hard to be a good legal writer. But I agree that there are, you can be a good writer generally. And to be a good legal writer, you know, don't assume that you know it just because you've been told that you are a good writer generally, that there are lots of things to learn about writing law that are pretty distinctive. So, uh, uh, so, Who's so you know, this in my job. I mean, I, I think of you know a big part of the job is is getting uh, is deciding the cases right, and of course you want to decide the cases right, but uh, a big part of the job is communicating to people why it is that you've reached a certain kind of decision, whether it's in the majority or in the in the dissent, because one of the things that we do as an institution is that we give reasons and. And uh, th that's an important feature of the institution is not only that we decide things, not only that we reach judgments, but the, that we actually reach judgments uh, that are explained and, and that are fully explained. And that's important to the parties, but it's also important to the broader society that has to live with our decision making. And in a very concrete way, it's, uh, it's important to, to lower courts who have to decide the next case and the next case and the next case so that they understand the parameters of our dis decision and so that they can figure out as best they can how to apply it to the next case and the next case and the next case. So there are all kinds of reasons uh, to think about how to uh, explain your reasons um, and, and why it is that that's such an important part of the job. And, uh, so what, who's my audience? I, I mean, for sure, the judges, the lower court judges, when, when I write a majority opinion, or sometimes when I write a dissent, mm -hmm. I'm in part speaking to lower court judges, how they should think about this opinion, how they should understand it, how they should apply it, when the next case and the next case and the next case, which might have slightly different fact patterns, will come along. Um, 
And I'm, I'm surely speaking to the parties who have a right to know the loser just as much, maybe more than the winner, has a right to know why it is that the court came out a certain way. The parties, of course, aren't usually lawyers. You know, yeah. um, uh, you, you hope their lawyers explain things to them, but the parties aren't lawyers themselves. And and more generally, I think of having an audience which is, you know, the kind of broad society that reflects on uh, what the Supreme Court is doing and that has to live with what the Supreme Court is doing. So. Um, you know, I actually try to make sure, I, I, I guess when I write an opinion, I, 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 uh, I ask myself, would like a non-lawyer be able to understand this? And it's really hard, because you don't want to dumb yeah. it down too much. And there are just some really technical, complicated things that you have to say in order to fully explain yourself. But to the extent that you can, uh, to make those things understandable and accessible, to people who don't have a law degree is, I think, something uh, you know that I, uh, I that is important, and 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 because I think that I spend a lot of time uh, uh, trying to do that. One of your audiences is, of course, your fellow justices who you are trying to persuade. Maybe they already are persuaded, but maybe you might lose them also, depending on what you say. And can you say something about, I think, what many people in this room are very curious about, which is your relationships with eight other distinguished people who you actually spent a lot of time with and you may not agree with about a lot of things. So how does that work and how do you get along with them and how do you talk to them after you've dissented or written an opinion that led them to the dissent? Well, I mean, uh, a big part of the job is trying to convince your colleagues and, and, uh, and listening to your colleagues, because maybe you should be convinced. Um, and that interaction um, 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 among the nine of you is a, is a really big part of the job. Um, now, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen in every case that somebody is convinced by a colleague, right? That there are some kinds of cases in which people have strong priors, strong views, that they sort of come in, come in with and approach a case with. And even where that's not the case, I mean, everybody's independently reading the briefs and everybody's independently thinking about the question. These are nine super smart, super thoughtful people, um, all of whom can reach decisions, uh, can you know, reflect on a case yeah. and reach decision on their own. Um, uh, so, you know, and sometimes that's the way we do operate, but, uh, but, 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 but I think that they're also, that as a court we're also sort of thoughtful people and that we're good listeners generally and that we listen to each other. And so, and so the potential is always there uh, to be convinced or to convince. And, um, and that's there in, in, in this case, in the next case, in the next case, year after year after year. You know, we spend so much time together, you know, 80 cases a year and then you know, uh, lots of us have very long yeah. uh, careers with each other. I might uh, serve on, on, on this court with people, you know, knock wood, for, for 20 or 30 years, right? So we're very much repeat players when it comes to interacting with each other, when it comes to talking about law with each other, when it comes to trying to convince each other. And if you don't convince somebody this time around, you know, maybe you will convince them the next time. And I'm sure that, uh, that they would think the same thing about, about convincing me. So, um, so I don't know, I think we, we got along actually remarkably well, given that we do often disagree with each other about some fundamental things. And, uh, and given that we write that down in print, yeah. you know, sometimes in, ways that are harsh. Um, uh, I think our ability to sort of say that's a part of the job, but you can't take that personally, and you have to forget it the moment it's over so that you can go on to the next case and the next case and the next case, I think is a really important part of the job, and I think we do it actually pretty well. Not that we never get annoyed with each other, not that uh, we can never use a summer vacation <laughs> to, to to sort of get away from each other a little bit, but I think I've been there now for five years, and every year I've come back, and I think that every year, <laughs> no, but I, I was going to say every year, uh, you know, when I come back, 
I think, uh, you know, uh, that you know we've we've left the petty annoyances behind us, and that we're ready to start a again, new year. Uh, to start in a, a new year. Uh, uh, you know, in a in a good frame of mind about each other, and and this the and we start once again. You know. Um, talking with each other, discussing with each other, trying to convince each other in what I think are pretty constructive ways. I, I think that this is a, a surprising and important feature of the legal profession. The first case I ever argued, uh, you know, I obviously I was very angry at the other side, the lawyer on the other side, he, he asked me out for a drink afterwards, and I said, but I don't like you. <laughs> um, and he said, you're going to see an awful lot more of me than you are of your client, who you'll never see again. And it was for me like this, oh, I guess that's true. We're Pete players. We're going to be in this profession yeah. together. And, and of course, it's not, 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 not necessarily true that you don't like your opposing counsel. It's true. I mean, it's true. sometimes you can think your opposing counsel is absolutely Pretty great. A, a great person. It's turned right? out to be a great guy. You know, yeah. a lot better than your client oftentimes. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people need to leave for class, and uh, we understand that. Class is an important thing. Um, I am going to open it up in a minute to questions from you, so think about whether you have one that you'd like to ask. Uh, I, I do have one last question for you, which is what's your advice to people who are starting class now? Many of them first-year students. Advice? You know, it's just a great, uh, to, th to think about this as a great experience, to not let it intimidate you, uh, to, um, let's say, what did I used to say to students when, in that Dean's speech that I used to say? <laughs> I used to say, um, get to know really well at least one professor, um, but, but, but also understand that uh, your colleagues, your peers can teach you as, as much as the professors can. So get your head out of the book sometimes and make really great friendships and, uh, and relationships with your colleagues. And Don't um, worry if you don't understand things right away. Don't worry. If, if, you under, if you think you understand things right away, that's when you should start to worry. <laughs> uh, because, you know, this is, this is hard and it's new. And, uh, you know, you should just expect that it will feel hard and new. Not just for the first day or the first week, but yeah. for a, a, a while. And um, uh, so just sort of soak it in. And I don't know. I loved the first year of law school, uh, although there were plenty of times when I thought it was too hard for me. And uh, so is, is, is that good advice? That's what, very what, good what advice. Would, what, would your, well, what is your I, advice? No, no. I think I've given some similar advice, but I'm still, I'm still looking and thinking about it. I do urge you to continue to get to know people and JD students get to know LLM students and vice versa. I mean, incredible, incredible resource right here. Um, is there a question from the crowd? Uh, and do we have a microphone? We do. So right here in the green shirt and say who you are. Hi, uh, my name is David. Uh, I'm a uh, first year. Uh, I, you mentioned earlier the uh, point about how there are uh, certain lawyers that you see over and over again. Uh, there are certain you know, people who argue before the Supreme Court very often. And I think there was like a report several months ago about just how prevalent that is, how like there, there's uh, sort of like an industry of people who are uh, very used to that. And I guess I, I'm curious to hear more about sort of your thoughts about um, there, there has, have been concerns in the media about people making sure they get the same access to justice and that you know the uh, people who are getting cert or whatever are, are not just from, you know, that there are uh, maybe negative consequences if it's just the same people. Yeah. So uh, this was a very interesting set of articles that uh, a, a, a fine journalist named Joan Biskupic did. I forget what it was called. But it was about the fact that there is a pretty contained Supreme Court bar. And, um, and, and there was some suggestion in these pieces that that had downsides as well as upsides. And, and I must confess that from a justice's point of view, and, and um, Joan Biskupic was, uh, you know, basically said this in the, ar in the article, that she could not find a justice who did not think that the upsides far exceeded the downsides. Um, so I think that we are of one mind of this. And, and I think that the, 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 the reason is because uh, we feel much better served and much better uh, able to decide cases when the lawyers that we encounter are um, 
are, are very experienced at the way in which we decide cases. And what's the most frustrating thing in the world is when somebody with an important uh, question and, and a position that really deserves to be represented as well as it can be is instead represented by a pretty inexperienced lawyer or even a lawyer who has uh, excellent experience in other fields but doesn't have it in ours, um, doesn't have it as an appellate attorney at the Supreme Court level. And uh, you know, for the, where you get most frustrated, and I, I think uh, on, on this court at this time it happens most in, uh, with respect to criminal defendants, is, uh, is where uh, their lawyers, although possibly excellent trial attorneys, are really just not the kind of lawyers who can best present a case to the Supreme Court. And, it's, and you, know, you try to be the lawyer for that person yourself, if you will, but uh, the, you know, honestly, uh, nothing compares with having a great lawyer representing you. And, and one of the things that I think, uh, I think about why is about why you, know, you shouldn't sort of go down the road of thinking that this Supreme Court bar is a bad thing is that there are ways to get the Supreme Court bar to represent most of the people who appear before us. Um, um, many of them do significant amounts of pro bono work. Many of them do are very, very happy to take these cases for free because it, um, it has other benefits for their legal practice. Some of them come from law school clinics which now, you know, there are many law school clinics that do absolutely excellent work. So it just shouldn't be the case that people uh, are deprived of excellent representation. And I think that the reason we all sort of appreciate the Supreme Court bar we have is that because uh, in, that it enables more people to have excellent representation before us. But sort of the whole idea of, oh, just sort of let's throw it open to everybody and who cares about qualifications or experience anymore, I think is a bad one and one not likely to lead to the kind of uh, access to, the, uh, to justice, effective access to justice that you're concerned about. Another question. There's one over here. And I, identify yourself. Thank you so much. My name is Chen Yuan. I'm an LM student and come from Shanghai, China. So did Nino ask you a question about Solicitor General versus Justice? I want to ask uh, what part of the, the dean job at the HLS that you miss the most serving <laughs> as a justice in the DC? Thank you. Uh, what, what, what part of the dean's job do I miss the most? <laughs> uh, you know, mostly I miss, uh, I miss the people here. I mean, I, 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 I really enjoyed students, and I miss that kind of daily interaction with students. And it's part of the reason why I come back to teach every year. So the reason I'm here now is just because I'm going to be teaching uh, a, a course this week for, what, like three hours a day for four days, so <laughs> that, uh, which is one credit's worth. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I do that. Um, you know, just so I can so have some contact with students again, which I find very invigorating and very stimulating. And uh, I miss my faculty member colleagues, you know, and part of the thing that I do in this course is I invite people to come co-teach with me. So I invite different people every year depending on the case. And it's just an, a good way to, uh, to reconnect with, with people who I spent a very considerable part of my life with and, and uh, who now I don't have much day-to-day -day interaction with. So uh, I guess mostly it's people. Uh, I don't, here's, here's what I don't miss. Let's see, I don't miss, uh, <laughs> I don't miss thinking about IT services. <laughs> I, 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 I don't miss, what are the really bad well, parts but, of this but job? Well, but you were, you're, you're on the con cafeteria committee at the Supreme Court, I right? am on the caf. I don't, I, yeah. <laughs> I can't get away from cafeterias. That's part of being the junior justice, is that you are on the cafeteria committee at the Supreme Court. I've heard the Chief Justice say that it's a way of sort of saying to people, that, you know, you get on the court, you're just, you've just gone through this whole confirmation process, you've now become a Supreme Court justice, Chances are you're thinking you're pretty happy with yourself, you know. Thanks. Chances, <laughs> chances are you're feeling a little bit too big for your britches, and 
then they put you in the cafeteria. <laughs> and it's their way of saying, well, not really, you know? <laughs> You're still the junior justice. <laughs> and you've done some good things for the cafeteria, right? <laughs> this cafeteria is really good. Well, yeah. that's true. We, we now have, a, we have a, a new caterer this year for our cafeteria. So. Excellent, excellent. I, I'm, very, I'm very confident that things are going to go well. <laughs> Would you join me in thanking Justice Elena Kagan? Thanks a lot.